Joining us today is James Bailey. Uh, James is an assistant professor of economics at Creighton University. Uh, his work focuses on health economics, labor economics, and entrepreneurship. Uh, today he's talking with us about the Affordable Care Act. So how does the Affordable Care Act work? What are the problems that it was intended to solve? And how well has it solved them relative to alternative systems? Uh, today, Dr. Bailey will argue that the Affordable Care Act was intended to expand health care coverage and fix a broken market in individual health insurance. Uh, while it is likely to achieve these goals, uh, he argues that it will also do so at a high cost relative to alternatives and will fail to address the most important flaws in the U.S. health care system. So please join me in welcoming James Bailey. Thanks, Thanks for coming out, everybody. You know, um, although I know lasagna is also a pretty great attraction, I'm not sure what the the bigger the bigger pull is there. Um, all right. So the the ACA. Um, before I jump in and talk about like the details of what the Affordable Care Act does, um, I want you to think about the big picture of the U.S. healthcare system and what it does and what its problems are. So um, the the ACA was uh, was our big healthcare reform. And uh, why did we have to reform, right? What was it that was wrong or broken about the system that needed fixing? And um, if you, I think everybody has their own opinions on this, right? Um, maybe some of you think uh, everything was perfect, right, until the Affordable Care Act came along and, and ru ruined it, right? Maybe some of you think there's, there was uh, one or two things um, that you can think of that when you think of healthcare care seem broken to you, right? Um, or maybe there's a whole big list. Right? You just think everything is terrible. Right? Uh, and so what reform was needed right? uh, or what you think we should have done is going to depend a lot on what you think the problem was in the first place. Right? And I think this is something um, there's a lot of disagreement about. Uh, but I'm going to list off um, a lot of the things that I think of when I think, you know, what is broken in the U.S. healthcare system or what, what was broken in 2010 before the, the Affordable Care Act passed. And as you can see, I come up with a whole big list. So I'm, I'm sort of more on the side of thinking there was a lot wrong with the system we had, and so we were clearly in need of, of some kind of change, right? Whether the Affordable Care Act was the right change or not, we'll talk about later. Okay. So what was wrong uh, or is wrong that, that needs fixing? Right. Well, as an economist, the first thing I think of is, is we have no prices, right? For the most part, in the U.S., we have a, a market system where you know the price of things, and, and this plays a big role in, in what you choose to buy. Uh, and what you choose to produce as a as a seller, uh, whereas in healthcare, most of the time, I think you have, have no idea what the real price of what you're buying is. So the last big thing I I did interacting with the medical system was go get an allergy test, and I thought, why not pay my $25 copay to figure out what allergies I really have? Right? Um, well, it turns out I could go on the insurance company's website later and, and figure out that they'd, they'd spent um, over $1,200 for this thing I'd paid $25 for. Right? And the only reason I even knew that was because of my own curiosity that I wanted to go look up what they paid. Right? Um, I had no idea. You know, most people would have no idea. And uh, they're definitely not basing their decision on, on what the price is. Right? If I'd had to pay the $1,200, there's no way I would have got that, that test. Right? Um, so we have no prices. Uh, in general, we have an overspending problem. So you've, you've probably heard uh, all the, the big scary statistics, right, about how uh, we spend in the U.S. twice what everybody else does, uh, what Canada does, what Britain does, what Europe, Europe does, what the whole developed world does. Uh, we spend about twice um, the average for the, the rest of the world. We spend drastically more um, than Switzerland, who's sort of number two uh, on a per capita basis uh, on our healthcare system, and it's not clear that we get better results you know, for all of our increased spending. Um, so we've got an overspending problem sort of in principle where maybe we're wasting about half of what we spend and then we have this overspending problem uh, for the government budget, right? where if you look at, you know, is the U.S. going to become Greece? Are we going to go bankrupt um, in 10 or 20 or 50 years? Um, you can look at some pretty scary government budget projections that make it look like we will, right? And the thing that's driving almost all of that uh, is expected Medicare expenses, right? It's not really about Social Security or so much, um, and it, it's really not about the other parts of the government. You know, um, the, the scary government budget picture for the federal government is almost all about Medicare. Right? So that seems like a problem. Okay. Um, then I look at the, the supply side of healthcare. I see problems. Right, it's, uh, we don't have enough doctors. We don't have good incentives for getting new drugs to market. Um, doctors have these incentives to 
overuse care since you get paid more every time you do another procedure. Right? Uh, and then we get to health insurance. Right? So um, people in the U.S. see health insurance as more or less a necessity. Right? And yet, before the Affordable Care Act, about 18% of Americans didn't have health insurance. It's one of the big problems with the system that seems uh, almost unjust right? uh, that um, a lot of people really want to fix. Um, uh, and then digging a little deeper into what's wrong with the health insurance system and maybe why 18% of people were, were lacking health insurance. Right? Uh, Employer-based health insurance was, is the dominant way that, that people get health insurance in the United States. In particular, if you look at people with private insurance instead of you know, government insurance like Medicare or Medicaid, um, it's 90%, you know, 90% employer, um, employer-based. Right? Uh, you can imagine some problems with this, right? Um, one big one. When you lose your job, right, you don't just lose your job, you lose access to this um, affordable, uh, high-quality health insurance. Uh, and then, um, so that's the clear problem that everybody can see, right? And then uh, the economist in me looks this, at this from a different perspective and says, this is an uh, employer-based health insurance system. It's not just causing problems on the health insurance side, it's, it's causing problems on the labor market side, that um, employers are making decisions about who to hire, possibly based on um, considerations about health insurance, which is going to lead them to hire people who might not be the best. You know, maybe you turn down somebody who's sick, even though they can work fine, because you think they're, they're going to raise your health expenses. Okay, so this leads to inefficiencies in the labor market. Right? And then finally, part of the reason uh, employer-based health insurance is so dominant uh, in the private market is that in the market for individual health insurance is, or certainly was before the Affordable Care Act, uh, broken. Right? Uh, it was not really a functional market. Not very many people used it. Um, prices for certain people could be astronomical. Insurance companies would simply refuse to cover some people, uh, or worse, they'll cover you while you're healthy, right? Uh, and then you could become sick, and uh, after your, your period of insurance expires, they'll stop covering you because they say, oh, now you have a pre-existing condition. Uh, we know you're going to be expensive. Um, the premiums you'd have to pay us uh, in order to make it that sense for us to cover you when you have cancer, you know, would be astronomical. You know, sure, we can give you insurance if you pay us $100,000 a year. Um, so that's the big list of problems that I think of when I look out at the, the U.S. healthcare system. Maybe you agree with some of these. Maybe you think some of them aren't problems. Uh, maybe you have some other problems of your own, of your own that, I, that I didn't list here that you see when you look at the healthcare system. Right? Um, so I think these are all the problems that um, I'm hoping, you know, when some big reform comes along, you know, we would have been able to solve. Right? And so then you want to think, well, um, how well is the ACA going to solve any of these? Right? Um, and then, you know, maybe there are one or two of these that, that you think are the actual big problems, right? And you can focus in on, on what the AC is, is going to do about those. Uh, so looking back, right, the ACA isn't the first time we tried to do a big reform of the healthcare system. Um, we've had a lot of big reforms uh, that were basically the, the government starting big new programs where it would buy people insurance, right? Uh, so probably the, the biggest reform ever in, in our U.S. healthcare system uh, was in 1965 where we started Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, so the government, uh, federal government starting to cover uh, large classes of Americans with, with public health insurance. Right? Uh, since 1965, we haven't really had change of the healthcare system, reform of healthcare policy on that scale. Right? We've had some minor expansion of government health insurance since then uh, with the state children's health insurance program covering a couple million people. Uh, Medicare Part D, so expanding the existing Medicare program uh, to cover drugs as well as what it covered it before, which is um, hospital care and, and physician care. Um, so we've had some other expansions there. Uh, and this is all happening on the public insurance side. Right? So the government is starting to give people insurance directly. Uh, the other thing reform efforts could try to do uh, is try to reform the um, private insurance side say, okay, people are going to get private insurance, but we're going to change how we regulate that, try to change the private insurance market. Um, and there have been, you know, some somewhat important bills there. These were all really minor, though, compared to what the Affordable Care Act has done. Uh, so uh, the Employment, Employee Retirement Income Security Act, that made it easier for employers um, to directly start covering their employees and, and paying for their insurance claim. Uh, COBRA made it easy to keep your employer insurance for a little bit after you leave your job, trying to loosen that, that tie between employment and health insurance a little bit, make it a little less disastrous to lose your job, um, and get a 
skewed that a little bit, right? making it, um, health insurance a little more portable after you lose your job or try to change jobs. Um, so looking back, right, I would say there's there have been some modest reforms, right, but there hasn't been this, this huge overhaul in the health, certainly health insurance system since uh, the introduction of Medicare and Medicaid in, in 1965. Uh, then we come to the ACA, right, which I'll argue is, is the biggest reform we've had since 1965 of the U.S. healthcare system. Um, so if you still, uh, in 2009, we get a new um, Democratic Congress and Democratic President, and they're they're wondering what their what their big new policy initiative is going to do, and they, and they start talking about health care. Um, and this eventually becomes um, the ACA, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of, of 2010, passed in March. Um, this is a kind of a, a very slowly implemented bill, right? So it was passed way back in, in March of 2010, and a few things about it took care uh, took effect right away. Um, it, uh, well, for the college students, right, one of the important things that took place uh, six months after this was that uh, 19 to 25 year olds um, can now be included on family plans, so have to be included on family plans. Um, to have, you have to have the option available. Okay. So uh, a lot of young adults are now on their parents' insurance who weren't before. Um, and so there were a few relatively minor provisions like that that took place more or less right away. Uh, most of the big provisions, though, didn't take place until uh, 2014 or even later. Right? Uh, and so really, even though this is something that was passed uh, five years ago, we're, we're just starting to see some of the biggest effects. Right? And so we're still trying to figure out what the bill is actually doing. Right? Um, and. Um, and that's just the congressional provisions, right? Um, so the, the way the uh, legal process works nowadays, right, Congress will, will pass this bill, uh, and even though um, the Affordable Care Act was famously 2,000 pages, right, it's a really complicated health care system you're, you're trying to reach out and, and change, right? So even those 2,000 pages can't really fully specify everything uh, that needs to happen, right? Uh, and so um, there's still a lot for the Department of Health and Human Services to decide how exactly this, this bill is going to play out. So that's still happening. Um, right. And uh, okay, just to, to note, as you, as you probably know, um, this ACA was in some sense inspired or, or built on or very similar to uh, 2006 Massachusetts health care reform. I'll talk about the similarities and differences later. Uh, so what was the ACA trying to do? So if, if you think back to the, the big list of problems with the U.S. healthcare system, and you think, um, you know, is the U.S. is the ACA going to fix all of them? No. Um, to give it credit, right, uh, the the authors of the bill weren't setting out to fix every possible problem with the, the U.S. healthcare system, right? Um, what they were closer to trying to do right, is to try to fix every problem with the U.S. health insurance system. Right? Um, so it's not the the bill in general, right? It's not really about uh, health care as a whole. It's not about health care delivery. Um, it's, there's not a lot that it's telling, um, say, doctors or other health providers that they have to do differently. Right? It's mostly reforming the payment side, payment side, the financing side, the um, insurance side. Right? Um, and so I think its main two goals were to reduce the rate of uninsured people. Right? We, thought, we think uh, it's crazy that the U.S. is the only um, developed country that doesn't have a near universal health care system, right? Um, most other developed countries, they cover 97, 98, 100% of their population have health insurance, right? And in the U.S., we were at more like uh, 80%, 82%, right? And so we think that's terrible. There are all these people who really need health insurance and don't have it, right? Um, so one big goal with the ACA is to reduce the rate of insurance uh, down to somewhere nearer to um, normal developed country levels, and then to fix this broken market for individual health insurance. Right? Make it possible for you to go out and, and just buy a plan on your own, not through an employer, uh, and have and be able to do so at a sort of reasonable price and get reasonably good coverage. Uh, and then third, uh, something that was talked about a lot at the time uh, in the discussions about the ACA, but which I think didn't really pan out, uh, was that uh, people were hoping to reduce the, the overspending problem, right? Um, to look at this, to, to sort of bend the cost curve, right, where we look ahead and we see uh, that Medicare is going to bankrupt the federal government in 40 years, and we think, let's let's try to nip that one in the bud. Right? Um, so that was another attempt um, that um, people talked about a lot when the bill was being 
discussed. I don't think any of the major provisions of the ACA really dealt with that. But um, so I think the, the ACA had maybe trying to address maybe two and a half of the, the big problems I listed. Okay. Um, so what I want to do next is, is describe what, it, what the bill actually did um, to try to address these problems and then discuss how well um, it's likely to work to address, uh, to address each of these. So uh, again, the ACA is this huge, complicated 2,000-page bill. It did a lot of different things. Um, I would break it down into six major components. And among those, um, I've broken it down into two groups. So one is, is requirements to buy and sell insurance, right? um, targeted at employers and individuals who are buying uh, and insurers um, making them sell. Uh, and then there are um, things targeting access and affordability, which I would uh, summarize as after we say that people have to have insurance, right, uh, requiring something doesn't make it possible. Um, if you require everybody to, to start flying um, by flapping their, their arms, it's not going to work, right? So let's do things to make that an actual possibility that people could really go out and get insurance. Okay. So I'm going to go through each of these uh, in big uh, ACA components in turn. Okay. Uh, so the individual mandate, uh, which you've probably heard about, this is saying uh, to uh, individuals, you have to have insurance coverage okay. uh, as of January uh, 2014. And if you don't, um, you're going to have to pay a fine, uh, which could be the higher of 2.5% of your income or uh, almost $700. Right? Uh, that, those penalties are being phased in, right? So this tax season um, is, uh, is the first time these are really being assessed. So you had to have insurance in 2014. If you didn't, uh, you could be taxed or fined for this, um, this tax season. Um, that tax versus fine dis uh, distinction turned out to be very important to the Supreme Court. Um, that's another story, though. Okay. Um, so we're starting out with, I think, a $195 fine, something a lot smaller, but it's going to work its way up to, uh, to $700. you have got to have insurance, or else we'll make you um, pay the fine. Um, as a kind of a side note, this meant you have to define what insurance is, right? What exactly are we making people buy? Um, and so each state is going to define uh, essential health benefits, right? Things that uh, an insurance plan has to include to be called an insurance plan, right? Um, and so that's maybe broadening um, what plans end up covering in some states and perhaps making the plans more expensive. Okay. Uh, so individuals have to have insurance themselves. Okay. Uh, and employers, uh, if you have a large business or really a medium-sized business, uh, you're gonna have to provide health insurance to your employees. Okay. So if you have at least 50 uh, full-time employees, um, you should offer them health insurance if you don't, um, you can get this fine of, of $2,000 per employee without health insurance. Uh, now, this was supposed to start uh, in January of 2014. Um, that got delayed voluntarily by the, the Obama administration. Um, then we got this interesting political situation um, where uh, the congressional Republicans, who've been trying for years to, to repeal the Affordable Care Act, um, sued the Obama administration to actually implement this piece of the Affordable Care Act. Right? So the, the administration sort of voluntarily backed off on this one piece of it, said, uh, let's, let's wait another year. Uh, and the Republicans said, no, you know, um, I guess trying to, uh, you made your bed, you have to lie in it or something. Um, so um, well, the, the administration delayed it anyway until January of 2015. Uh, supposedly, um, this requirement's now in place, um, but in 2014, uh, it wasn't until February or March after the supposed January start date that it got delayed. So who knows? Um, and there was, uh, and it got delayed again for um, medium-sized businesses, actually. So um, this requirement, it was supposed to start now for supposed to start in 2014 for 50 businesses with 50 plus employees. If you have 50 to 100 employees, you got a, another break. You know, you don't have to start until 2016. But large businesses, 100 plus employees, really are supposed to start providing health insurance. Uh, this year. Um, so this is um, getting directly at the goal of trying to reduce the rate of uninsurance, uh, and it's also indirectly trying to save the government some money uh, from paying subsidies for individual insurance, which I'll talk about later. Uh, so individuals have to buy insurance, uh, or have to have insurance. Uh, employers have to provide it, uh, so they're mandated to buy. Uh, and then we target insurers. Okay? 
So we want to tell insurers, if people come to you asking to buy insurance, you have to sell it to them. Right? So this is, in a way, it's trying to make it possible for, for people to go buy insurance, right? Because the individual market, the way it was broken before, a lot of people would go attempt to buy insurance and be denied. Right? The insurers would say, we think you're too risky, we don't want to cover you. Right? At least uh, not at any price we're willing to quote. You know, maybe for 100,000 a year or something, something ridiculous. Uh, under guaranteed issue, right, this is sort of a, a mandate for insurers to sell. So anybody who comes and asks you for insurance, you, you have to sell it to them. Um, and so you can't deny them for having pre-existing conditions, right, for having some health um, sickness uh, that you think is going to make them really expensive. Um, and you know, as of January 2014, um, you know, this applies for everybody, uh, started for kids right away. Um, and if you did this in isolation, right, if you just had guaranteed issue, um, you can get people gaming the system. Right? So uh, if insurers have to buy insurance, no matter what, right, you've kind of got this incentive to not buy insurance until the last minute. Right? So let's say you know, you're 20, 25, you're young, you're healthy, um, you don't have any recurring health expenses that you want insurers to pay. Why do you need insurance? Well, maybe you'll get cancer, and then that'll cost hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right? Um, but under, under a guaranteed issue system, you could game the system and say, well, I, I just won't get insurance. I won't pay premiums. Right? Um, and then if I ever do get cancer, right, I'll, then I'll sign up for insurance. And um, you know, only I'll be paying premiums of, of 200 a month, and they'll be spending tens of thousands of dollars every month on me. That's, that's a pretty good deal. Right? Uh, but if everybody does that, of course, the, the insurance system breaks down. Um, so this is another part of the logic of the individual mandate. Right? It's not like um, we're just forcing people to buy insurance because we think insurance is, is great and, and they don't know what they're doing when they didn't buy it before. Right? We think now that we're starting this guaranteed issue system to try to make it easier for people, for people to buy insurance, we created this possibility of gaining the system, um, and so we need to um, uh, prevent that. Right? Um, so. In the 2012 election, we had this fun spectacle of, of Romney versus Obama, and, and so um, you know Romney had had signed off on the Massachusetts health care reform that was sort of an inspiration for the uh, the U.S. you know the national national level reform. Um, and yet, um, for various political reasons, he thought uh, that during the election he should try to attack uh, the ACA, right, and say you know what I did in Massachusetts was totally different and it was great and the ACA is terrible, right. Uh, and for the most part, the laws were really, really similar. Right? Uh, so he had a, sort of a hard sell. If, you're, if you want to look for differences between them, one was simply quantitative. Right? So a lot of the fines for the, the national reform, the ACA, are a lot bigger. Um, but another was, uh, was about what the states looked like beforehand. Right? Um, so you know, as one of his explanations, Romney would say, well, Massachusetts is different from the rest of the country. Right? And, you know, that kind of sounds like a silly argument, and at the time I thought it was a silly argument. Um, then I learned more about what the legal landscape in Massachusetts was like before uh, they did their reform in 2006. Right? And so they had guaranteed issue in place before 2006, and it sort of wrecked their, their system. Um, and they ended up with some of the, the highest um, premiums in the country. Uh, and so, like, if you pass one of these things in isolation, Right. It doesn't work very well. Um, so John Gruber, who um, uh, the MIT economist who helped um, design the, uh, the Massachusetts and, and the national reform, he talks about this as a, a three-legged stool. Like you have to have all of these pieces together. If you just have one of them, it's, it's going to fall over. Well, Massachusetts had tried building a one-legged stool, right? And so you could uh, you would try to fix that by getting rid of the one leg, going back to sort of what the rest of the country was like, or you could go forward and add on the rest of this, and in particular, add an individual mandate. Um, and so he decided, well, Massachusetts broke their system with guaranteed issue. Let's go forward, add an individual, ma individual mandate, add, uh, add subsidies. We'll, we'll fix everything. Um, but the U.S. Though, as a whole hadn't broken, broken their markets with guaranteed issue alone. So we didn't necessarily um, have as much to fix as Massachusetts did. So. Okay. Um, so um, we tell insurers they have to cover you. Right? But they have a pretty obvious way out of this, right? They can say, oh, sure, we'll cover you, right? It's just going to cost you $100,000 a month, right? 
Um, we're being very generous, we're complying with the law, we're offering you insurance. Right? Um, so insurers can kind of game the system as well um, to get out of this guaranteed issue requirement. Okay. Uh, so the next provision, uh, community rating, is a way of keeping insurers from gaming the system once you're telling them they have to sell to everybody. Right? So uh, the way health insurance in the individual market worked before the Affordable Care Act, your insurer would try to find out a lot of information about you, determine what your health risk was, and quote you a premium based on what they expected your cost to be. Um, and now it's a lot harder for, for insurers to do that. We sort of limit, limit um, what information they could use to raise or lower your costs, right? Um, so uh, you could do an extreme version of community rating and say everybody pays exactly the same price for health insurance, right? Um, so health insurance in the U.S. just costs $500. That's what it costs, $500 a month, right? So um, we didn't quite do that, right? But you, what uh, insurers do have to do is sort of start out with the same premium for everybody in a certain geographic area. They can do down to the MSA level. But you start out with the same premium for everybody, and then you can adjust it a little bit on the margins. Right? You can uh, increase it if you're adding more people to a family plan. You can increase it for older people, but only up to a limit. Right? So um, you can only charge 64-year-olds sort of a max of three times that you charge the 18-year-olds, whereas if insurers are left to their own, they tend to make this five or six times. Right? Uh, and then tobacco, you can charge smokers 50% more. And that's it. Right? So you start out with the same premium for everybody in, in a geographic area. You can change it basically on three different things. Um, but more or less everybody who pays the same premium can't um, charge sick people more or people with pre-existing conditions more. Uh, there are some things that maybe you should be able to charge for right, um, that you can't. Right? So I think the justification with tobacco is not just that smokers are more expensive to cover, it's that we're hoping to reform people's behavior um, to make them healthier. Well, well maybe rate on BMI as well, right? But no, uh, that's, that's illegal now. Okay. Uh, but the, the justification of community rating, right, again, once everybody's paying close to the same price, um, it's going to be possible. No one's going to have to pay a truly outrageous rate. So nobody's going to be quoted a premium of $5,000 a month. Right? Nobody's going to be quoted a premium that's sort of truly unaffordable. Okay. And yet, Right, even if people are being quoted relatively reasonable premiums right, of, of $500 a month, right, they still might not be able to pay. Okay, um, so we want to figure out what to do there. Okay. Um, so there are sort of two steps to that. We, we built exchanges and subsidies. So these are the last two uh, um, big parts of the, the ACA. Uh, so the exchanges, these are the, the portals for buying health insurance um, that famously weren't working very well for the first couple months. Um, and um, this is just sort of a curated way of, of showing the um, available plans on the individual health insurance market to people. There were private companies doing this before, like eHealth Insurance. You go to eHealthInsurance.com, you look at the plans. Um, one big uh, reason for doing these exchanges is the federal government is going to be offering people subsidies to buy health insurance, and they're going to use, you know, you have to go through the exchange uh, to get the subsidies. Um, so each state was supposed to set up their own exchange. Most of the states declined. This is one of the big uh, political issues um, that's currently before the Supreme Court. So um, the way it looks like, the way the law was written, right, maybe the, the federal subsidies have to go through the um, uh, state exchange. right? But instead, since most states declined, uh, 37 states declined, the federal government set up their exchanges. And it's possible that the way the law is written, um, people aren't going to be able to get the subsidies they thought they were going to get if your state didn't set up their own exchange like, like we can do. Um, so that's before the Supreme Court right now. Uh, and then finally, these subsidies, right? Um, so again, you know, we, we're mandating that people buy health insurance, but mandating doesn't make this, uh, it actually possible for them. Um, so we want to make sure that people actually can go get health insurance. And so if we're mandating that poor people get health insurance, we got to subsidize them. Um, and so the government will, federal government will step in, um, cap the proportion of income that people can end up spending. Um, so if you're you know, uh, near the federal poverty, poverty line, the amount you end up spending on health insurance is never going to be more than 2% of your income. Uh, these subsidies go up really high to people at three times the poverty line, um, but there the subsidies will get smaller. You can be spending up to 9.5% of your own income on, on health insurance. Um, so these uh, subsidies are for people buying individual health insurance through the exchanges. Uh, that's for people who are doing relatively well, right, who are above the poverty line or above, just over the poverty line. 
Uh, the other thing we're doing is expanding Medicaid, right? So this is a, a big uh, federal and state government um, public health insurance program. Um, it started in 1965. When it started in 1965, it, it targeted poor mothers and children, right? And since then, a lot of states have been exchanging, uh, expanding it to cover um, uh, much broader swaths, you know, sort of poor people in general, right? Um, and the, the government wanted to sort of take this national. Um, Medicaid differs a lot from state to state, sort of like 50 different programs, but it has a big federal component. The federal government pays most of the costs. Um, and so the, the feds wanted to um, do what a lot of individual states have done, but do it everywhere, right, and, and offer Medicaid to everybody up who makes up to 133% of the poverty line. Um, and the federal government tried to make this, uh, well, they, they tried to make this a, uh, uh, an offer states couldn't refuse, right? Um, so they were, they, the way the ACA was originally written, they told states, um, hey, you guys are going to expand Medicaid uh, the way we want you to, and if you don't, uh, we're just going to pull all of our Medicaid funding, right? Um, so it's sort of go big or go home, uh, and they're just assuming that the states we're going to go big, right? Nobody would um, be willing to sacrifice all of the, the Supreme Court, uh, sorry, all of the federal government funding. So this also went to the Supreme Court, it's been a popular destination for pieces of the, uh, of the Affordable Care Act, and um, got struck down, right? So they um, basically the feds tried to offer a carrot and a stick to get states to do what they want, right? Uh, and the Supreme Court thought that stick is sort of too big a stick to be thumping the states around with. Um, I think the language. Uh, Supreme Court justice actually used was it's like putting a gun to head of, the head of the states, right? To offer to take away so much money if you don't expand your programs. Right? So now states have the option to to accept this expansion. Um, the carrot is still there, and it seems like a really good carrot, right? Um, the feds would pay all the cost of the expansion in your state for the first three years and 90% afterwards. Uh, and yet many states have been turning it down, um, including Louisiana. So the green states accepted it. Um, the orange states rejected it. And uh, the blue states ex uh, sort of accepted it on their own terms, uh, accepted it with, uh, with sort of these weird conditions. Uh, and this is, um, corresponds really well to basically whether your state had a Republican governor or not. Um, so there's this big political element. So as you can see, politics is, is a theme running through all of this in terms of how the, the law is ending up getting uh, implemented. Um, so I, I think I'm running out of you know, time to be talking at you for a while, so I should uh, wrap this up and, and open the floor to questions pretty soon, but I'll just say, um, looking forward, um, if, we're, if we're trying to figure out what the ACA is actually going to do, um, one, one thing we, well, so we passed it way back in 2010, but a lot of it's just getting started now in 2014, 2015, um, so it's sort of hard to see, you know, we can try to look around us, but, you know, really we're going to have to wait a, a year or three until the data's in, um, see what's going on here. Um, one thing you can do is look back to Massachusetts, though, sort of like, um, you know, a version of the ACA that started uh, four to ten years earlier. Right? Um, and so looking at Massachusetts, they seem to have accomplished their goal of reducing on insurance quite well. Um, so Massachusetts, another way they were different from the rest of the country, they started with the lowest rate of uninsurance in the country. So they started with a 9% rate compared to the, the national average of 18. Um, <clears throat> And they went down from there to get what's now by far the lowest rate of uninsurance in the country, uh, 3%. Right? So you know, in Massachusetts, it sort of looks like um, the rest of the developed world now, right? with only a 3% un uninsurance rate. Um, so that looks like a big success. Right? One question, though, is did they do this um, by all these clever regulations that fix the individual market, or did they do it by just throwing money at the problem? Right? Uh, and it's sort of hard to tell these apart, right? because um, you know, you can look and say, well, a lot of people got health insurance through their exchange, uh, and all, almost all of those people who did were getting subsidies. Right? So is it the fact that they set up this exchange uh, and did all these new regulations that made people go to the exchange and get this health insurance, or is it the fact that they started throwing all this new money at it to subsidize that purchase? Right? It's not clear, um, but um, basically everybody who did get health insurance as a as part of the Massachusetts reform was getting a subsidy, so it's, you know, at the very least, it was a somewhat expensive way to, to solve the problem. And then also in Massachusetts, um, you know, people did more or less comply with the mandates, right? Even though the fines in Massachusetts were a lot lower uh, than the national fines are, right? 
So, um, you know, when you look at um, their fine of 200 bucks for not getting health insurance, you might think that's not enough to influence people's decision, right? You can still game the system, right? You can still wait until the last minute to get your health insurance. Um, and yet, for the most part, people people listen. You know, they're not gaming the system. Right? So that that's just kind of surprising to me. Um, so we can look at Massachusetts, see things are sort of working okay. Um, and then the real question go, going forward um, when we're trying to figure out what's going to end up happening with the ACA is what ACA are we going to end up with, right? So what else is the Supreme Court going to strike down? Uh, or what else is Congress going to repeal? Or what else is the administration voluntarily going to change? Right? Um, so it's a complicated picture going forward. Uh, there were also all these other minor provisions that the uh, other different things the ACA did, which um, any of them in their own, if well, are, they're really pretty important in their own right, but compared to everything else the ACA did, it's, it's pretty minor. So I'll, uh, I'll skip those for now and uh, just conclude and say the way I see the ACA, I see it as a, a great leap sideways, right? We made all these huge changes um, to our healthcare system, the biggest changes we've made since 1965. Um, and I think we went from one system that broadly works but has a lot of problems to another system that broadly works and has a lot of problems. Uh, I don't think it was worth it. I don't think it's worth going through all that again uh, to go back to what we had before. Right? I think we went from one kind of okay system to another one. So uh, I was, maybe I wish I had a stronger, more rousing conclusion for you, but I think uh, the Affordable Care Act, it demands ambivalence. Uh, thank you. about 2008 or 2009, um, Medicare started taking a turn for the better, right? Um, so all of these, all these scary graphs have been getting less scary since 2009. Um, and so we've had uh, six years or so of, of some of the slowest cost, gr cost growth in Medicare history. Uh, and this is a big puzzle for us, right? Everybody's sort of trying to figure out, uh, is this a fluke, right? Uh, are we, like, next year going to go back to the, like, 6% cost growth every year? Uh, or is this a new normal, right? Uh, is Medicare really just going to grow as fast as the rest of the economy does? Um, and uh, if it is the new normal, then why, right? Was it the Affordable Care Act? Uh, was it the recession and that's going to end? Or, or was it something else? Uh, and honestly, um, all the health economists are just really confused about this right now. Um, I will say that even a lot of the advoca advocates of the Affordable Care Act have been reluctant to take credit um, for the slowdown in Medicare costs, uh, I think because they all expect that it really could end next year or end in two years. Um, so it, that's mostly a puzzle. Um, I will say, um, while most of the big pieces of the Affordable Care Act um, weren't really about um, bending the cost curve, a lot of the, the smaller ones that I, that I didn't talk about were. I think so. Yeah. Right. The crux of the, I mean, everyone's, you know, I mean, most people I know are working in the service industry and the service sector. But then that other giant sector, the health insurance or the health industry sector, that is built on a foundation of continued financial support. Well, I think what what most people who were could see the, uh, you know, the writing on the wall were looking at was you had a generation. Of we're in there. 
teens in the early 2000s going to the adults just opting out of buying health insurance. And if that trend continued, that whole labor sector, you know, granted, you know, you still have a lot of baby boomers that are reaching their, you know, their age to, to receive service, they would be, you know, still paying those costs. But what the whole system is premised on is the fact that you have a new generation of people that are going to be entering into the market and then paying some of those costs for people that are receiving health care right now. Mm -hmm. What I thought was just a really genius idea of, uh, <coughs> pardon me, well, a genius idea of the uh, Obama administration is to consult with the health insurance companies, create what looks like this uh, you know, uh, beneficent bill, right, which will uh, you know, give everyone health insurance, right? But um, what it really is is just a, a bailout to those industries in disguise, while at the same time politically making himself look Yeah, it's um, it's a really interesting time to be a health insurance company, and it's really interesting that um, so when um, the Democrats were trying to build a coalition to get a, this big health care reform passed, they got the insurers to at least not stand in the way of it, right? To to at least be you know lukewarmly on board. Right? The insurance company was on board. Yes. I thought that they were uh, co co authors of this bill. I thought that there was a consortium of the top one hundred. Uh, I don't know a lot about the, <laughs> the exact details there. I will say, um, looking at what, what happened to them, they had, um, so there's this huge insurance reform, a lot of different pieces. When I think about what it's like to be an insurer now, right, you've got the mandate, which is this unprecedented, you could call it a bailout, certainly a bonus, right, um, where, I mean, this doesn't really exist anywhere else in the, in the economy, right, where the state is, is saying, um, the federal government is saying, Hey everybody! You all have to buy this um, private service, right? Or else we'll we'll fine you, right? Or now we have to call it a tax. We'll tax you, right? Um, and so there's this huge increase in demand for for health insurance because of that, right? And this big increase in demand from the federal government um, with the uh, the subsidies they're they're giving. Uh, on the other hand, one of the the somewhat minor provisions that I I didn't talk about is that uh, we're now capping. Um, basically how much you can possibly earn as an insurer. So, um, oh, update. Oh dear, <laughs> I can't stop the update. Um, that's just like the new versions of Windows. Um, okay, well, um, now uh, as an insurer, um, you have to spend uh, at least 80% of the premiums you take in on uh, medical costs. Um, so. What else could you do? Well, you have administrative costs, you have overhead, right? And so now as an insurer, um, you're sort of capped at 20% you know, of the revenue you take in from premiums. That's the most you get for everything you do. You know, everything else has to go out the door to um, basically bu buying medical care for patients. You know, and then you get that 20% that you can spend on paying all your employees, covering all your overhead, doing everything you need to do, and profit. Right? So now, like, so that your, your demand went up, right? Um, the, the amount of premiums you're taking in has gone up as an insurer, right? And so that seems good. But on the other hand, um, you can't possibly make more than a 20% profit on, on all of your premiums. Right? Um, and this seems to have actually been implemented, right? If you, if you, um, if you don't spend 80% of, of your revenue uh, on medical care, you have to just rebate it to your customers at the end of the year, cut them a check. And they're really doing it. I got one of these checks. Um, so, you know, we've, we've done all these things to make life a lot better for insurers, and then we've done this one big thing to, to cap their profits. So it's, it's a really weird time in the industry. Um, you know, I don't know if I'd want to make that investment, um, you know, maybe because uh, I have some weird preferences, you know, but I, I, I sort of don't like the idea of I can never make a big return, but I can make a big loss, um, even if the return has gotten somewhat safer, and they probably will turn in steady 5% profits every year. Um, I wouldn't like knowing that my profits are absolutely capped. Yeah. As you look uh, forward, the uh, labor participation rate seems to be dropping. It really seems to be continuing to drop. And there's a tremendous amount of immigration taking place. Um, and the, a lot of employers.
employers have cut their hours back to reduce the number of uh, water subsidized health insurance. This doesn't seem good for the NAC as you go forward because mm -hmm. the bunch of uh, subsidies will be growing while the payers will be shrinking. It, uh, has anybody done projections on this since? Yeah, so um, Casey Mulligan has a book. Um, on the Affordable Care Act, uh, which is really looking at the labor market side. Um, I should really, really remember what it's called. I just read it two months ago, and he cites my papers. Uh, but um, he's, um, he sees a pretty bad future for the labor market effects of, of the law. Um, and, um, you know, actually the problem he sees really is, is the employer mandate um, yeah, causing employers to hire fewer people um, and to hire more of them part-time. Um, but the, the numbers he sees is, is, you know, is there may be sort of two to three million jobs at stake here, right? Um, so if you're one of those two to three million people not getting a job or not getting health insurance, that's a really big deal. Um, although I wouldn't, you know, but uh, at the biggest picture, I wouldn't say it's like budget breaking or anything like that. And with the immigration, I don't know what the numbers are there. We get uh, two million a year or so, um, and I think most people come because they expect to have a job, you know. And, and as the labor market here gets worse, um, people stop coming. Um, you certainly saw that in the recession, where um, Mexican immigration reversed uh, for a few years because there were there were no jobs here. Yeah. I have uh, two questions. My first one is a follow-up to the question you uh, asked earlier about the twenty um, percent profitability. Um, it, uh, even though you're always making 20% uh, profit in each in the, in, on each individual case, because you have more participants entering yep. the market, could uh, would it not then become economically viable and profitable because it becomes a case of all those pennies adding up to a fortune? Yeah, it's it's possible. Um, yeah, so um, it sort of depends how how profitable you were before, right? So that 20%, um, that's, that's your profit and all your administrative costs and paying all your employees. So in, in practice, it's probably gonna work out to more like a five to maybe 10% profit. Um, and uh, so that then it could work out either way, right? Insurance companies could be better off or worse off. It depends sort of just how much they're losing out on profits and just how many more people they're getting. Um, in practice, a, they're probably getting cut off from about three to five percent of their profits uh, per person, and they're getting maybe ten percent more people. Um, so, yeah, maybe. So it's yeah, yeah, you could be better off. Yeah. My second question is: Is there an um, economic basis for a lot of criticisms that came from conservatives regarding the ACA, such as? that insurance uh, premiums would go up, many people would lose care, and the death panel. Is there an mm -hmm. economic uh, basis for a lot of those groups? Uh, so losing care, um, the overall rate of health insurance coverage is, go is going up. Um, you know, so the, the early figures <coughs> look like um, things are working there. There's, there's the question of whether, what you can actually buy with that health insurance. Right? So this is a classic criticism of Medicaid um, that you, know, you give people what you call health insurance, but you know they go try to find a doctor, and 70% and of the doctors say, oh, you have Medicaid, we don't want to see you, and the other 30% say, oh, you have Medicaid, we'll see you in two months, right? Um, and so one worry um, that I don't think uh, I know any good evidence about one way or another is, is that all these new people will flood into the system with health insurance, and, and no doctors will be available to take them. Um, so that's, it's, uh, it's definitely a valid concern. I don't know to what extent um, it's actually playing out that way. Um, what was what was your first one? Yeah, um, death panel. Death panel was last. I'll, I'll do, do that. Death panel, and also that premiums will go up, and also oh, yeah. the other one I, uh, I remember uh, a lot of criticism that American type of Canadian health system is that you can't just open up your wallet and there's health care. You have to wait in line mm -hmm. for health care. Yeah. Is there an economic space for any of those criticisms? Well, yeah. So we're we're increasing. We're basically. All, all this added health insurance is going to increase the demand for health care um, without necessarily increasing the supply. Um, one of the other problems with our health care system that I hadn't talked about is we have all these restrictions on supply, so we might not 
be able, we certainly won't be able to quickly ramp up healthcare supply in order to meet all this additional demand, which could lead to lines, you know, like I said, I don't think we have good evidence yet about um, whether it actually is leading to, to lines or not. Um, premiums, um, it, again, it's not totally clear whether they're going up or down overall. The really strong premium effects are going to be based on your age, right? So what is really, really clear uh, is that if you're young, you lost, and if you're old, you won, right? Uh, and if you're healthy, you lost, and if you're sick, you won, right? So what community rating does basically is, is push uh, everybody's premiums to be much more similar to each other, right? Whereas the system we had before was that if you were healthy, you could get really cheap in health, health insurance, and if you were sick or, or old, um, you could only get health insurance that was expensive or you couldn't get it at all, right? Um, so basically, the, the big effect is that everybody's premiums are getting pushed toward the middle. If they were low before, they're getting higher. If they were high before, they're getting lower. Um, what it's doing to overall premiums doesn't seem to have a huge effect. Um, in Massachusetts, premiums actually went down, but Massachusetts, like I said, was really unusual in, in that sense that they had really broken their, their individual market beforehand, um, and so then this sort of fixed it. Uh, and then on death panels, I would say there's, there's, there was nothing to that. There, there are a few different things you can mean by death panels, right? So um, one actual part of the law that, that helped inspire the, the rhetoric about death panels was that Medicare wanted to start paying, uh, reimbursing healthcare providers for doing end-of-life counseling. Uh, and one thing you could tell people during end-of-life counseling uh, is that, hey, assisted suicide is an option, or you might want to sign a, uh, a living will that says we're going to cut off care at some point, right? Uh, and that got people up at arms, right? So they, they didn't want doctors at all, you know, getting reimbursed to advise people in that way. That was the most sort of realistic part of death panels. Um, another part of it um, was Medicare's Independent Payment Advisory Board, right, where you would have uh, this group of experts doing a little bit like what NICE does in Britain, you know, a sort of minor version of it, where you try to figure out uh, how cost-effective different treatments are. And um, if you determine that there's a treatment that's really not cost-effective or not medically beneficial, then Medicare shouldn't pay for it, right? Uh, and then the version of death panels that I think got talked about during, like, the election that was, you know, more or less totally unfounded was, like, there's going to be a, a board that's going to meet to decide whether you live or die or whether or not you're, you know, it's worth, you're a good enough person to be worth giving any medical care to, right? And that wasn't in the bill at all. Maybe some people wished it was, but um, that, that wasn't there. Um, and then the, the iPad, though, that's, that's a real debate. That, that's going to keep going, going on, right? So one of the big reasons Britain um, has a, a spends so much less than we do right, is they have this national system, and uh, they refuse to pay for a lot of things. Right? Um, they'll try to figure out how effective medical treatments are on average. And if they think there's this treatment um, that will maybe get you an extra year of life, like maybe a, a new cancer drug, it'll get you a new year of life, but it'll cost us $100,000 for every extra year of life you get, Britain's not going to pay for that. Right? Um, whereas Medicare is going to say, oh, sure, you know, if, if a doctor gives it to you, they, they probably know what they're doing, we'll, we'll just pay for it. Right? Uh, and so you know, what uh, the IPAB death panel would have you know, started to do is move us a little bit in the direction of Britain, right? where if we think this treatment is not effective at all uh, or is not effective relative to how costly it is, Medicare will just say, uh, you guys are on your own, we're not paying for that. Um, so the ACA has, has met, or at least gone a ways toward meeting some of the goals, like substantially reducing the number of uh, uninsured, mm -hmm. uh, and not all of them. I just wondered, what would you consider a great leap forward? Mm -hmm. Maybe Canadian single payer or something, and I, I, in particular, to bring down the cost per capita of health care in this country to yep. something in line with the rest of the developed world. Yep. Um, so I'm a fan of Singapore, um, you know, so, you know, when everybody looks around at, at different countries, um, you know, um, people who want more government involvement, you know, you can look at um, Canada and Britain where the, the government, you know, sort of more directly provides health care. You can look at um, a lot of the rest of Europe where uh, the government um, has enough involvement to, uh, you know, get a relatively universal health insurance system. Uh, Switzerland, actually, uh, if you're looking for what we're going to be like going forward, Switzerland has a system that's sort of most like what the post-ACA U.S. looks like. They have an individual mandate that people have private health insurance, right, that sort of thing. Um, and then, you know, so in all these countries, they spend, 
you know, sort of half to two-thirds what the U.S. does, and they get broadly similar outcomes, and so people think, oh, yeah, we could do that. Um, and, and maybe Medicare really should be more like that. So one, one thing I think people don't realize, you know, about um, single-payer might not actually be that expensive, right? So um, the U.S. government actually, government in the U.S. actually spends about as much as Britain does, right? Um, you know, so overall, we spend twice what Britain does. Half of that's government, half of that's private, right? So we're, in a way, we're sort of paying for national health care and not getting it, you know. Uh, we pay what Britain does, and we only manage to cover old people and, and poor people, you know, and Britain manages to cover everybody, right? So, you know, maybe there's something the government could do to become a lot more efficient. Um, but, um, you know, to me, the, the real example is Singapore, right? So um, most countries, we spend 18% uh, of our GDP, 17, 18% of our GDP on healthcare. That's huge. Most other developed countries spend like 8 to 12%. That's pretty good. Singapore spends 5%, right? And they're just as healthy as everybody else, if not, if not healthier, right? And they do all this with a, with a relatively private market. Right? Um, and basically once health insurance is cheap enough, Right? You don't need all this government involvement to make it possible for people to get affordable health insurance. Right? Um, and the best way to get health insurance cheaper is, is to get the cost of care cheaper. Um, and I think people being able to see prices would be a nice step forward there. But um, we're, we're sort of in this, this weird hybrid system where we get sort of the worst of free markets and the worst of government. Um, you know, you can look to Singapore, which is in a lot of ways more of, more of a free market system, although most of their hospitals are, are public, um, you know, or you could look at um, Europe, where in some ways it's, it's a more government-run system and they do all right, and, and here we are in the middle spending twice what the government systems do and three times what the free market systems do and, and not getting better outcomes than they do. It's a weird place. So much of the price regulated for the private companies, how can they still compete with each other? Um, I would say for the most part they don't, right? So health insurance is actually this, this incredibly concentrated market. Um, I mean, so think, you know, for those who have, like, private health insurance, like how many, really, uh, how many options did you have, right? There were maybe a few plans to choose from. Um, most of them were probably from the same company, right? So, like, if you have employer health insurance, you know, you might have three or four plans to choose from. They're probably all from the same company or maybe from two different companies. Uh, and that's not just like one employer. In general, in the U.S., if you look at, um, say, the county level, uh, most people will have like one to, to, to two choices. And, and at a lot of localities, um, uh, a single insurer will have 90, 95 percent of the market. Um, so largely they don't compete, um, which, which can be a problem for consumers, right? Um, so this could be efficient, right? It could be cool to have everybody pool together into one insurer because then they have lots of bargaining power to get lower prices from doctors and hospitals. Uh, and they do do that. They do bargain prices down. Uh, but the more, the stronger effect seems to be, yeah, they, they lower their costs by, by getting the supplier prices down. And then they don't pass that on to consumers at all, right? Instead, they just use their market power to, to charge higher prices. So um, it seems like uh, when you do get another insurer to enter the market, prices are going down 5 to 10%. Um, so we could use could use more competition, and it's not entirely clear how to get it. So I would separate insurers and healthcare providers. Uh, with insurers, there's a limit to the subsidy, right? So it's going to trickle down. I mean, like uh, the, the cost that insurers pay does trickle down to uh, care providers. Is that what you're saying? Well, uh, so there's this subsidy for buying insurance, right? Um, it's going to top out at um, you know a few thousand dollars, right? Um, and so 
Um, do you have an incentive to lower the cost of insurance? Yes and no, right? Um, you have an insurance. You have an incentive to lower it sort of down to the, the maximum of the subsidy, but not really to lower it any any lower. Right? So I, I think we will see a lot of plans coming out charging sort of exactly you know at the top of the range of the subsidy. Yeah. My second question is, um, uh, I, what role? Because I, I feel that this is like another failing of government to actually reform the healthcare system because I think that the healthcare the healthcare system has been broken. But where I see it broken is there's a lack of government. So there, there, there are some price caps, in particular on, on drugs in the U.S. And a lot of states um, will have their own regulations setting maximum prices for drugs. Uh, what I would like to see, which would be even easier for governments to do, uh, is just to say, hey, whatever your prices are, we're not going to tell you what they need to be. Just make them public, right? Post them, um, and so people can can shop around. Um, and they they did a tiny bit of this. You know, Medicare is is starting to share a little little bit more of, of what they know about. I want to say one more thing about the, the subsidies, though. Medicare used to work that way. So nowadays with Medicare, um, well, you still don't have a huge incentive to lower your costs because it's, it's a fee-for-service system. You know, like, for every hip surgery you do, you get paid however many tens of thousands of dollars, so you can just crank them out, you know, and get as many patients as you want. Uh, the way they used to do it, though, was even worse. It used to be a cost plus reimbursement. So let's just say however much you spent, um, you know, doing that hip surgery will give you all that money you know, plus like five percent more, right? So then you really, really had no, you know, actually had an incentive to spend more because then you could, you could bill more and get a percentage of that. Um, you know, now they've at least moved to fee for service, where you have an incentive to keep your cost down on any given procedure, but then you also have an incentive to do too many procedures, um, or at least halfway to controlling costs on, on the, the type of procedure. Well, were there any? You mentioned there's going to be a shortage of doctors and things. Is there any incentives? Mark responding to that problem, at least partially, by beginning to differentiate levels of service among a whole range of professionals instead of just mm -hmm. physicians. Yes. There's practitioners, yes. Uh, medical assistants. Uh, I have a sibling who's a pediatrician, and, and I'm always surprised at some of the levels in her office, mm -hmm. nurse and this and that. So it, it does seem to me that the market has some response. Yes. To that, you can increase supply for certain, for certain things. Yeah, and I'd love to see more of that. Um, you know, a lot of the, the AMA in general seems to always be fighting back against this, you know, and trying to restrict what other other providers can do, um, and you know, and getting states in on their side, you know, to pass laws restricting what um, you know, saying nurse practitioners and supervision and things like that. So you're recommending that the anti-monopoly laws be enforced? Well, so. I, a tab flip, I'm sorry. But I was, I'm just curious how, how one does, other than the political arena, yes. how do you go after professional associations yeah. to, in effect, restrain trade? Yeah. I, I would say that, you know, bef before using the laws to try to, to reduce their power, you have to stop using the laws to try to increase their power and rates. So a lot of the, the mechanism by which things work is, is, is you know, the AMA, you know, some, to some extent, they're able to get what they want because of, of their role within the medical profession, but they also have this big lobbying arm where they're sort of getting state governments to restrict what um, other practitioners are allowed to, to do in the state. Um, you know, and, and yeah, some of it really is on their own, though, you know, like accrediting to med schools. Um, that is, there, is there really any solution to cost in the long run 
leaving aside pharmaceuticals for a moment, is there really any solution to cost that would not ultimately reduce the relative share of income that physicians receive? Because the biggest difference that I see comparing, I teach post-war European history and the whole social revolution after World War II, and the biggest difference I see in, in medical delivery is, is purely at that level. Yeah. So, with all due respect to my sister's pediatrician, I mean, the fact is that uh, first-rate physicians in Europe may be paid very well, several hundred thousand a year, but it pales in comparison to what they make here. So, yeah. how does one address that, or do we have it? Yeah, I'll say I hope there's a way, you know, because my wife's a, a doctor as well, you know, so, and I, and I feel like um, there is a bit of a clash there, right, in that a lot of what um, health economic reformers want to do is say the AMA has too much power and doctors make too much money. Um, and so that doesn't play too well at home. But, um, and yeah, and, and when you look around, right, American doctors basically are the best paid in the world. Australia is somewhat similar, right? But um, in the US, um, doctors make um, five times what the average, five, five and a half times what the average American does. Um, and the average American is doing pretty well even by developed country standards. Um, that's, that's not normal. You know, when you look at the rest of the developed world, the average doctor is making two and a half times you know, uh, what, what the average person does. Um, in Britain, it's one and a half. Um, and, so, and yet, British doctors seem to be pretty good. Um, so there does seem to be this big, uh, big transfer to doctors, which, again, privately, I can't really object to, but um, you know, probably is that's one way we could um, 